Good morning, everyone. My name is Yuri Schmidt. I'm the president of the Brazilian Association for Energy Recovery for Waste, a brain and the president of Waste to Energy Research and Technology Council, WTH Brazil, and partner at Gerard Advogados. Uh, I have a master in law in public policy from UNICEUB and write the book. The name is Waste to Energy as an Environmentally Appropriate Form for Disposal of Municipal Solid Waste. And now we're starting the second Abrain International Webinar, Waste to Energy Technology. Vamos começar agora o segundo é, webinar internacional sobre tecnologia de recuperação energética, Waste to Energy. É, vamos falar em inglês deste evento, mas você que está nos assistindo agora, fique à vontade de nos mandar perguntas para os canais da Abrain. Nosso e-mail abrain, arroba abrain.org.br, estaremos à disposição para tirar todas as dúvidas. É, the organization is from a brain, and we have the support from Global, WTRT Council, BDA, Martin, Itachi, Kinin, BW Expo, Energy RG Hub, Ambiental Mercantile, Agenda Urbana Brazil. And now I want to call for uh, Dr. Edmund Fleck to talk about waste management, an established part of waste management in Germany. Uh, Edmund has 30 years experience in waste management. He's the managing director of Martin and currently Martin Technology. He's the director of Martin Biopower, PTI also. He's the president, uh, he was the president of East West, European supplier of waste energy technology from 2004 and 2019. He's a member of ISA, ISA Working Group on Energy Recovery. His PhD in mechanical engineer from the University of Minnesota, and have a master in physics from the Richland Westphal Technology University, Aachen, Germany. Please, Edmund, have the word. Edmund, uh, just have to put microphone. Yes, that's yes, it. I did this well. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for letting me uh, give this presentation on waste energy. I hope uh, that you can see my presentation. If not, please let me know. Yes, you can share the screen again. The same procedure. It's not shared? Yes, the green button. Uh, share the screen in the Zoom. Okay, sorry. Yes. Okay. That's Even nice. though we have also been in home office for quite some time, I must admit I'm not that used to this. What I will talk to you about is that waste energy is an established part of waste management in Germany. Um, basically four big topics. I will talk a little bit in the beginning about the statistics and some regulations which are valid to this industry in Germany. Then I talk about waste energy development over the years and uh, there were some technological options. The major part, I think, will be waste energy, what's reality in Germany today, and then draw some conclusions. Germany has about 83 million inhabitants. It's a little bit over 350,000 square kilometers, so quite small compared to many other countries, especially to Brazil. We are a federal republic, uh, 16 states where some of these states are cities like Hamburg, Bremen, and our capital city, Berlin. So when it comes to waste arisings in Germany, then the majority in 2018, which are the last figures available, the total waste is about 420 million tons, of which a majority was recovered. And quite a few of that was recovered thermally, which means in some kind of incineration plant. When you look at the details for 2018, these, oops, I'm sorry, again, these 420 million tons, what is of interest to our discussion today is basically these, what is called Siedlungsabfälle, which is municipal waste or similar waste, about 50 million tons total. Majority, like in many countries, is obviously construction demolition waste, which is almost more than half of that. So of these 50 million tons, there were 33 million tons were material recovered and about 15 million energy recovered, which is basically waste energy, which we will talk about. Per capita, you see what every German 
generates in terms of waste um, in 2018, 455 kilograms, which does not include electronic waste. And you can see here what are the different big fractions. This is biological waste, about 120 kilograms. This is, um, this is re um, re material for recovery. This is basically the 100, almost 160 million is MSW. Majority of that is obviously then be going to waste energy. And there's a little bit of large waste and some other waste streams. So per capita, we have about 450 ton kilogram per capita per year in Germany in 2018. Quite a bit of waste that we are generating still. Regulations. This is not true for Germany alone, but for all of the EU member states, all regulations come from Brussels. That's a very straight and very clear rule. Regulations are drafted in Brussels. They are passed eventually, and then they have to be put into national law in every EU member state. Typically, there's a four or five year time frame um, for each of these regulations where they have to be put into national law. The only drawback is that there are no real good sanctions if countries don't do that. Some member states are a little bit more um, active doing that, some are not. So there's not a lot of good sanctions. Germany is playing a very active role in Brussels in the legislation, especially in uh, waste management. And many of the rules or the data taken, the limits, etc., are taken from German experience. I've been very active in Brussels myself as president of ESWET, the European Association of Waste Energy Technology Suppliers. There you see a lot of German uh, people from the government that are very active in supporting new regulations. In Germany itself, waste management is responsibility of the federal government. So the federal government based in Berlin is drawing the rules and then each of the states, each of the cities in the end, it trickles down the way, have to really base, uh, play by these rules. So it's a very clear structure. It's a very good structure, in my opinion, that you really have a federal government saying what the way forward is, and then basically it trickles down to the local level. What are the main regulations in Germany at the moment covering waste, and especially waste to energy? This is only an, an, uh, um, a shortcut. There's one that was passed in 1993, Technische Anleitung Siedlungsabfall, which is shortcut TASI. This is the tech technical regulation for waste. Basically, what it says, you have to stop landfilling of waste with more than 5% loss on ignition. So it's not a straight on landfill ban, but it's basically an indirect landfill ban because normally municipal solid waste or anything else like that has more than 5% loss on ignition, so it's no longer allowed. The big issue at the time, and I will come back to that in the later part of the presentation, is that it went into force in 1993, but there was a transition period of 12 years for this law to be taken in effect. And this was a very, very long period, which uh, led to a lot of shift in the regulations in the technologies developed. Very important for waste energy plants is what is called the 17th BIMSH, the 17th Federal Emission Protection Ordinance, which basically regulates all the permit conditions for waste energy plants, which is emission limits for certain pollutants, which is uh, minimum oxygen content, et, et cetera. So this is really the main law that governs the permitting of waste energy plants in Germany. It has been, uh, it's quite an old law in the end, but it has been last changed in uh, 2013. And there will be a change pretty soon again, based on the recent discussions on the breath documents in Brussels, uh, in Sevilla, is, uh, which ended last year. So there will have to be a change of this audience. This is one really very much to remember. What is important, and I think this is not only in Europe, but it's worldwide now, is circular economy. In Germany, we have a called Kreislauf Wirtschaft, which literally means circular economy which clearly says we have to go away from the habit that we had for many decades to really use products only once, but try to keep them in the economy as long as simply possible and feasible. Again, this law describes a lot of things, but among others, recycling rates for packaging waste, for municipal solid waste, etc. 
This came into force in 2017. And again, it's basically a law coming down from the circular economy directive uh, passed by the EU some years ago and then being trickled down into German law. Waste to energy, it's not very new. I mean, in the Middle Ages, in Europe at least, people threw their waste out of the uh, window. So you had very dirty streets, you had all these uh, hygiene, hygiene was very bad. And this caused a lot of headache and a lot of diseases. The first waste incineration plants, I wouldn't really call them sometimes waste to energy, but incineration plants were built in the late 19th century in England around 1870s, in Hamburg, in Germany, in the end of the 19th century. So these were very simple plants, obviously, but already they had some electricity generation. There was some district heating use, and they even used the bottom ash, as you can see here, two big bricks. So a lot of the concepts that we have today have already been put into force then that uh, you make use of the energy in the residual waste that you cannot recycle anymore in some form and uh, then also use the materials that are left after the incineration for usage. So again, a concept that, we are, that is very important today, but nothing that uh, we really, really have our generation has invented, but has already been in place in the late, in, in the late 19th century. There are some pictures of uh, plants, which obviously around the turn of the 19th to 20th century, which were quite messy because they were sometimes batch type. People had to feed the waste by hand. People had to take out the residues afterwards by hand. So this sometimes later on, you had like a carriage where you took out the bottom ash. It was all very simple, but it was a concept that was working. There were a few plants in, in England, in Germany, in Denmark, but it didn't really last. Waste to energy really only started in Germany, but also I think across Europe in the, after the Second World War, where basically people, the economy was good enough, so there was enough money available. Um, landfill was considered to be not the best option. And so there was also a drive to uh, make use of uh, waste as much as possible, of, of uh, materials as much as possible. So this is where basically it started in Europe and in Germany as well in the late 1950s. As I said before, with the setting and force of this uh, technical ordinance for, for waste in 1993 and the very long transition period of 12 years with no landfill tax, so there was no charge, no nothing happening in between. There were many other options that were being considered because as it is still the case today, and as you know, in Brazil and all over the world, waste incineration was by many people not looked at very favorable. So there was mechanical biological treatment plants being developed in Germany, especially. There was a lot of discussion on alternative thermal treatment pro uh, processes. And I will talk about that. What we obviously want to avoid, what is not an option, is what you can see here, it's landfilling. I mean, these are pictures from some places in the world. Landfills, people are living off landfills. They are getting into fire. This is what happens if uh, waste collection doesn't happen in the city. This is in the south of Italy. So basically in the heart of an industrial area, this is not what we want. And even the green people that don't like incineration, they, uh, in, 19, in 2010, published a report in NARTEC in the United States, where they clearly say disposal, end of disposal of waste from human cell and landfill sites. This is what they said for 2020. I think we more or less got there in, in Germany that uh, waste that still contains biologically active material is no longer being dumped on landfills. So, Biological, mechanical, biological treatment. As I said before, landfilling of biodegradable stopped in mid 2025. At this time, we had a green social uh, democrat government and they don't like um, waste incineration. So there were some developments of mechanical, biological pretreatment plants. Some plants worked, sometimes some plants failed. There are still quite a few in operation today. today and the mass balance is basically you can recover some metals, which is good. You have some loss of evaporation because you need some heat, basically some evaporation to drive off the water. 
there is still, and this was a change that was uh, got, that was allowed by the law that you can still landfill the low calorific fraction. And then there was something that was considered in the early days to be something valuable, a high calorific fraction, because you drive off the water, so you increase the heating value. And this was supposed to go to coal-fired power plants and to cement kilns. And in the early days, when these plants were developed and the business plans were made for the, for the projects, there was even thought that they would get a positive fee, so you'd get paid for the high calorific fraction. We have about 50 plants in operation, six to seven million tons of MSW go in there. And the remainder is about 50%, as I said before, that um, are remaining after this treatment. What you have to remember though, is that the heat energy content totally is almost not changed. I mean, there's some, some rotting, some carbon, um, some uh, re chemical reaction, um, so that you generate heat and then you drive off the water, but the energy content is still more or less the same. And especially the, or the material that makes non-recyclable waste, a difficult waste, organic materials, contaminants like chlorine, fraud are still in there. So they are still basically a material that has to be taken off very carefully. In, in the end, coal-fired power plants did not like this because they had uh, very, very much afraid of corrosion in their boilers. And cement plants are taking only a very small fraction. It's, uh, these figures are from 2012, but they have not changed dramatically over the years. So basically what happened in the end, that for these three to four million tons, we had to build in the end waste to energy plants after all. They are not called waste to energy plants. They are called RDF or, or secondary re, uh, recovered fuel plants. But in essence, they are the same technology and the same type of material like waste to energy plants. And again, I'm citing, I like to cite this, um, this presentation by uh, Mr. Welzin about mechanical biological treatment. And I only want to draw to the conclusion at the bottom, this techno technology is an intermediate. And what we have seen in Germany in reality is that because of the economy that they cannot sell the high calorific uh, uh, fraction, but they have to basically pay a fee for that. A lot of the plants have been shut down or when once they are reaching the end of life, they will not be replaced. They will just be torn down. Thermal treatment of waste, there are three basic processes. It starts basically with pyrolysis, goes to gasification, there are different uh, possibilities and then combustion. And basically you can see this here. It basically starts with uh, pyrolysis. There's no air injected, so there is no oxidation happening, gasification, there's an incomplete uh, oxidation happening. So you create a combustible gas that you still might use in a different process. And then you have straight incineration or combustion where you completely oxidize all the burnable material. There was a lot of discussion and a lot of hope to have so-called alternative thermal treatment plants. As I said, pyrolysis, this is based on a study, these figures that um, Iswa did some years ago. I was part of this working group where we looked at different uh, of these technologies. There's about 25 plants worldwide based on pyrolysis of, again, municipal solid waste, mixed municipal solid waste, non-recyclable waste. The capacity is very small, about 1 million ton, mostly in Japan. Gasification, again, it's a single stage which means there are plants that are having a gasification stage and then integrated a combustion stage, which is not really the main, there's not really big advantage in terms of compared to incineration. There are 50 plants, again, small capacity. Two stage gasification, which create a syngas, a combustible gas, which can be used for something else. There are even fewer plants with a very small capacity and plasma gasification, which is just one means to gasify the, the, the um, material, there's even less plants. When you compare this to MSW, there are more than 2,000 plants in the world and which more than 100 million tons of, year, uh, uh, of year per year capacity. So we are talking about much larger numbers and much larger experience and um, proven record. So again, Mr. Welzin says, these technologies have not shown reliability so far. This was in 2010. 
I don't think this has changed at all up till now. There have even been more pros, may have plants losing money, people trying to get this working, but it doesn't work for mixed municipal solid waste. Now, a short intermediate Martin company. We are a small company based in Germany. This is our head office where I'm sitting right now in Munich. We are almost 100 years old, family owned. First generation, the founder, second generation, third, and the current fourth generation. 100% family owned. We are definitely one of the main companies in the waste energy sector. Um, since 1925. This is a picture from the um, patent application in 1925. And this is one of the largest plants in the world in Amsterdam, six lines. So we have a lot of experience and we have a large reference base. And it might be interesting to know that the first two plants on our reference list are, have been built in Sao Paulo. I mean, they are no longer operation today, but this was in the late 50s, the first two plants after and then we build plants in Munich and uh, more in Europe. So what is great combustion? It's rather simple as shown here. You have a feed chute where the waste is transferred from a bunker to the feed chute. And then it's basically pushed by a device called a feeder onto the grate itself. There's combustion air from below primary air going into combusting the waste. And then the bottom ash, the burnt out material is dropping down at the end. The not completely burned out gases are then oxidized by secondary air, and then they give off the heat in a boiler to either drive electricity, a turbine generator, or to give it off as steam. So this is a very simple picture of the combustion system. A total plant then can look like this. This is like a horizontal grade in this case with a boiler, and then the very elaborate flue gas treatment to meet the emission limits that are very stringent and very tight not only in, in uh, Europe, but in most of the countries in the world where these plants are being built, they want European standard emission limits, which are quite low emission limits compared to many other industries. Some pictures of plants. This one is in uh, Ingolstadt, a little north, about an hour north of Munich. Uh, three lines total built in these years you can see here. One line at Salamelis, this is, um, in Thüringen, one of the new federal states in Germany, Coburg, also Bavaria, mines on the Rhine River, three lines. And again, Mr. Welzin citing that advantage is a proven technology for many years. I mean, this was something amazing for a green person to say, and he is not something, he's a scientific assistant in the parliamentary group in the Bundestag in the federal parliament to say when using with best available technology, there's very low environmental impact. So I think it's something that uh, speaks almost for itself. What is the waste capacity in Germany that we have right now? We have about 70 plants that are straight uh, waste to energy plants, capacity about 20 million tons. And then we have about 30 plants of what I said before, these plants built basically to take to take high calorific fraction. It's called Azatsbrennstoff, RDF, secondary recovered fuel, some high calorific material developed from MSW by some pre-treatment process. The capacity of that is about 25 million tons per year capacity. And at the moment, the last years, the usage was basically 100%. At the moment, we are burning in Germany year after year about 25 million tons of non-recyclable municipal solid waste or waste from commercial industry. We export a lot of energy. We create, we recover close to half a million tons of metals, ferrous and non-ferrous. And there's quite a substantial amount of sales of CO2. The six and a half, five million tons, six and a half, five, six point five million tons, sorry, is about the CO2 uh, emitted by 600,000 people. It's clear we cannot save the energy uh, problem in any country. There are projections that maybe if you have a good uh, energy recovery rate, you can maybe have three or 4% of the electricity need covered, no more than that, but we can make a very valuable contribution and especially avoid landfilling. So the, what are the conclusions? Waste to energy and waste energy plants are definitely an integral part of German waste management. There is a lot of opposition that is not changed at all. Working close with the public, is obviously very essential to uh, inform them as early and as, as 
open as possible. The market in Germany is mainly replacement. There's almost no greenfield projects. There's also no capacity increase, but mainly to replace lines that have now become 30, 40 years old, which is a typical lifetime of a waste energy plant. And for the technology, it is great based plants that are the technology of choice because they are proven, they're reliable, and they are there to basically make use of the energy and the materials in ways that cannot be recycled in a sensible way. And I think 25 million tons in a country like Germany speaks a role. There is um, a very clear statistics that say we only take away from landfill, we don't take away from recycling. We want to really use the waste that is not recyclable anymore, that is at its end of its lifetime and uh, avoid landfill. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Edman. Excellent, good presentation. Uh, I have said to everyone that was assisting us in this webinar. Uh, at the end, we have 30 minutes to, you can make uh, some uh, questions to us in YouTube live and we we'll give the answers. Uh, now, I want to, to call for Christian Cordome uh, to talk about the whole of waste to energy in both uh, sides of the channel, France and United Kingdom. Cordome have 30 years of experience in the environment and energy sectors, vice chair of Isa Roken Group Energy Recovery. Uh, he's a member of the Scientific and Technical Committee of ISWA, the De Development Director of Clean Environment and Energy Sector. He's former Deputy General Manager at Labs SA, whereas he worked from 2001 to 2012. He's a member of FTST, OFAIT, Armour C, RISPO, Prewin, and United Nations Tax for, for Air Pollution. He's an engineer graduated from Minis Parish Tech, France. Please, Cordon, have the word. Thank you very much. That's great. Uh, just a moment. Can you hear me? Yes, that, that's nice. Okay, uh, so it's okay. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Yuri, and thank you very much, Edmund, for your presentation. Uh, so uh, in my presentation, I will focus on uh, uh, both sides of the channel, so uh, France and United Kingdom, and to uh, to compare a little bit the, uh, the story between uh, these two countries, where we have a lot of uh, energy from waste. Uh, could you see the, the next slide? It's okay. Okay. So, uh, just a few words about uh, CNIM, CNIM in English. Uh, we are mainly turnkey project designer and supplier for environment and uh, energy, uh, and especially renewable energy. Uh, this is the type of plant that we are building uh, this energy from waste plant for Sheffield in UK. Uh, but we are also involved in biomass to power, for example. And uh, uh, for waste, we are also building uh, mechanical and biological waste recovery with sorting and composting or uh, sorting and material recycling, just as this brand new plant that we have built and that we are operating in Paris, which is uh, sorting in which we are sorting uh, almost uh, completely automatically uh, material from the uh, selective collection from Paris. It's a 45,000 tons uh, per year uh, waste. Uh, in total, all the plants that we have built uh, uh, are recovering the material and energy from municipal solid waste of 110 million people around the world. Uh, this is a view of a plant that we have built uh, in Torino, uh, Turin, north of Italy, close to the Alps. This is uh, more or less half a million tons of waste which are treated in this uh, plant to deliver power and heat to district heating. Uh, you can see there a, a photo of a car, a sport car, because uh, this uh, architecture 
has been done by a very famous uh, Torinese uh, guy, which is Bertone, who is designing cars, but who has also designed uh, the architecture of this uh, facility. Another architecture that you might know, because it has been shown on the, uh, 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 on the broadcast and so on, which is Copenhagen. Uh, in this plant, we have built with our subsidiary, LAB, uh, which is the leader for flue gas treatment, the flue gas treatment. Uh, you can see on the left here the uh, scrubbers uh, and uh, the uh, flue gas treatment that we have built there in condensation. Uh, and 200 million people uh, in the world have a waste combustion flue gases cleaned by lab process. Uh, this plant is famous because the architect has designed this plant to have a ski slope, artificial ski slope on the roof. I recommend you to have a, a view on this uh, on YouTube uh, where you could see a, a freestyle skier uh, going down this, uh, 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 this plant. It's very surprising uh, to see such uh, uh, sport there uh, but it can accept uh, uh, the, the, pub the public to have some ski so if you visit Copenhagen uh, you can have uh, some fun on the roof of this plant which is only one kilometer away from the Queen uh, Palace of Denmark and to finish the presentation about Klim uh, sorry. Uh, we are also operating facilities. Uh, this is the example of Baku in Azerbaijan, which is the very first energy from waste plant in this area uh, that we have built Turkey and that we are uh, operating now for 20 years. And we are also operating plants in France and in UK. Uh, so let's talk about the uh, waste energy situation on both sides of the channel. So for both uh, who are very far from Europe, the channel is the sea between the uh, United Kingdom and, uh, and France. So first about the status in France and then uh, what has happened in UK recently. A few words about technology and ways to energy impact on greenhouse emissions. Uh, so first a few figures about uh, France and UK to compare. About the number of inhabitants, you see it's around 65, uh, 70, 67 million inhabitants. And the amount of waste which are produced is between 31 to 34 million tons of waste, municipal waste, both in the two countries. So it's very similar for these type, for these figures. Uh, the, from this uh, waste, about 12, 11 to 12 million tons, so it was 2015 figures, uh, are uh, thermally treated. So it's the same, very similar. But you could see there on these figures that uh, some differences. First one is that we have much more plants in France than in UK, um, more than 129, and compared to 56 in uh, UK. And the average age of the plants in, uh, uh, in France is 25 years compared to 13 only in UK. So some uh, difference there. Uh, another difference is about the energy production, mainly uh, uh, electricity in UK. Uh, and it's a cogeneration in France. Uh, so electricity and heat, you could see there 24 terajoules compared to only one uh, in UK. So just a moment, it seems. Just be aware, the video he just started. Okay. So it's better. Uh, you could see on this map, which has been done by uh, the CEWEP, which is the association for the operation of plants uh, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, the number of plants by country and the amount of waste which are thermally treated by these plants in million tons. So you, you could see once again, uh, 40, so it was in 2017 there. You could see there in Germany, the 96 plants, almost 130 million tons of waste, uh, 20, uh, 27 million tons of waste burned in, uh, 
in Germany. 95% uh, of these plants are using uh, great combustion as uh, Edmund has uh, informed us. Uh, this graph is very interesting from CWEP once again, coming from uh, official statistics from Europe, Eurostat, uh, comparing the shares uh, between uh, landfilling in red by country, then in orange, waste to energy, a share, and in green, recycling and composting. You can see in average in Europe that we have 23% of waste, municipal waste going to landfill. 28 going to waste to energy plants and 47 for recycling and composting. This is the average for uh, European Union. In United Kingdom and France, this is quite similar. There is 17 to 19 percent going to landfill compared to 21 in France and 37, 35 percent uh, going to waste to energy uh, in both countries. But in Germany, as Edmund has shown us, 31 is going to, almost nothing is going to landfill, uh, as it is the case in Sweden, in Denmark, or in Belgium. On the contrary, on the other side, you could see Eastern Europe countries where, like Greece, for example, 80% of the waste are going still to uh, landfill. This is another way to present the figures with a trigram, recycling, landfill, and thermal treatment. And you see the two dots for United Kingdom in France. You could see there countries where there is a lot of landfilling uh, and uh, the, uh, the best of a class where there is almost no landfilling. On this figure, you could see that there is no countries with 100% thermal treatment. It's always a mix between recycling and uh, thermal treatment, uh, which is uh, the good solution to treat municipal solid waste. Uh, to finish the comparison, you could see there on this graph the average capacity of the plants. So it's only 120,000 tons per year in France. It's quite small, but we don't have a very dense uh, country. Uh, in the United Kingdom, it's about the double, 230,000. And if you compare to Netherlands, where it's almost 600,000 tons per year for each plant, uh, it's rather uh, small, but uh, Netherlands is very dense populated uh, country. So the situation of, of the waste treatment in France, uh, if first we have to, um, to separate and to look differently two types of waste. First, commercial industrial waste. You could see on these figures on the left, industrial waste and on the right, commercial waste. Sorry, it's still in French. And you could see that for this type of waste, it's quite easy to recycle material. Uh, you could see there are 67% of industrial waste which are recycled, 11 million tons, and uh, only 10% of the waste which is uh, going to waste energy facilities. But only also 8% going to landfill. It's quite easy to recycle such uh, uh, waste, and it's rather similar uh, also to uh, for commercial waste. It's rather easy to recover the material in this type of waste because it's homogeneous, uh, more homogeneous than less polluted in general. So uh, it's more easy for the industries uh, to recycle the material inside. In the number of, if we have only a, a look to the number of facilities, uh, sorry, of facilities uh, in France for the waste treatment, you could see that there were a, a huge number of landfill in brown there which was about, uh, about 500 uh, landfill in the 90s. And there was also a huge number of very small facilities for uh, uh, waste to energy. At this time, it was without uh, recovery, very, very small facilities. Some of them, which were only wor wor working during uh, the week, were stopped during weekend or even stopped during the night. Uh, so after uh, very strict regulations coming from Europe and uh, uh, applied in France, uh, these plants, most of these plants have been closed to install flue gas treatment and they have been replaced by much larger facilities. Uh, it's the same for uh, landfill. They have been uh, the small ones and especially uh, the uncontrolled ones have been closed to change for sanitary landfill. Uh, and we could see there, uh, of course, an increase of 
sorting facilities and composting facilities at the same time. But this number of facilities is not the most important point. The most uh, important one is the capacities. You could see there that the facilities without energy recovery, so only uh, with a combustion of the waste, uh, has decreased to almost uh, zero and has been replaced uh, by much bigger facilities uh, with energy recovery, efficient energy recovery, uh, to go up to uh, almost 15 million tons of uh, tr waste treated in the 2016-17. So we have closed the small facilities, installed through gas treatment, and have larger facilities there uh, to replace them. Uh, and at the end, for municipal solid waste, uh, so not commercial industrial waste, we have a mix of uh, solutions. Uh, so about 38 million tons are, so this is municipal solid waste, 38 million tons are going to uh, treatment. 32% are going to waste energy facilities. 16% uh, to organic recovery and 10 million tons to uh, material recovery. So in total, we have 75% uh, recovery uh, with these three types of uh, treatment. Still, in France, we have 9 million tons, 24 million, 24 percent, without any recovery going to uh, landfill. You could see that uh, waste combustion without any uh, energy recovery is only 0.2 million, so it has been uh, reduced to almost zero. Uh, so, but still, we have uh, landfill in uh, in France. With the material recycling, it has a very interesting impact because 66% of the paper which is used in this industry is coming from recycling. 50% of the steel is, going, is coming from metal recycling. 58% uh, of the glass uh, is coming from recycling. Uh, the only product where it's difficult to recycle is plastics. Only 6% is uh, recycled uh, in plastic industry. And the plastic, which is the most easy to recycle, is uh, uh, plastic bottles. Uh, film, plastic films and things like that are extremely difficult to recycle. At the end, in France, when we compare the shares between energy from waste, recycling and landfilling, you could see that the landfilling has decreased, but slowly. It was 12, 30 million tons, and now it's 8 million tons. Uh, you could see an increase, but very small, of uh, energy from waste and an increase of uh, composting and material recycling. It's more or less flat because uh, initially we had a lot of facilities in France and we have improved uh, the uh, working, revamped them for flue gas treatment and increased the sizes to obtain this result. Uh, the point is because of that, uh, a lot of our facilities, you see 100 facilities, are, uh, have an age higher than 25 years. Even one third of the waste treated in France are treated in waste energy older than 35 years. Uh, so this age uh, is, uh, needs to, uh, to revamp some of the plants. And we have quite a few plants which are brand uh, new. Uh, some examples of revamping that we have done uh, in France. This is a plant close to Versailles. Uh, uh, in uh, close uh, in the Paris region, uh, this plant has been built 45 years old, uh, 45 years initially, 45 years uh, old, uh, with two lines. We have built then boilers. We have built a third line, uh, installed through gas treatment, and in fact, the two very two old lines, 45 years, have just been replaced by line four uh, of 12 tons. So the total capacity of the plant has not been changed, but we have changed the energy efficiency, uh, the energy recovery with a brand new uh, a turbine and replaced completely the flue gas treatment with, uh, it was a wet system, we have changed it for a dry system with uh, NOx uh, uh, treatment. Uh, so you could see uh, this very difficult work of revamping because this plant was uh, still in operation during all the, so it was initially like that, 
the two old lines with line four, three, sorry. And we have replaced these two old lines by line four. But the plant has remained in operation during all uh, this uh, extension. Another example of revamping is Rambert Villers. It's in the east part of France. We have called this plant uh, Phoenix. Uh, we are working for Suez on this plant, uh, who are supplying the shoe to stack, uh, a new line of 10 tons uh, per hour and new for gas treatment. So you see the operation. There are very few greenfield plants in France. Uh, Trois is a plant that we are just uh, building now. It's the first one since 2011 as a complete greenfield project in France. Uh, it, we are a uh, turnkey supplier for Veolia. It's a public service delegation, so it's a, it has been financed by Veolia. And you see it's a small plant, very small plant, 60,000 tons per hour. So it's technically possible. It's quite expensive to build such small plants. It's much less expensive as a gate fee to build much bigger plants. Uh, but in this area, it was a, a good solution, nevertheless. Uh, in France, it's the 50th uh, uh, plant, 5 zero, that we are building in France uh, for a total capacity of almost 9 million tons per, per year. Uh, uh, a last example of a, a new plant uh, uh, in France. This is in the island overseas, in the island of La Réunion, so close to Madagascar. Uh, we have obtained this contract to build a plant which will burn RDF, which will, will be prepared on site, 140,000 tons, more or less, of CSR, which is the French word for uh, RDF. Uh, and uh, this RDF will be prepared on site and then going to the waste energy facilitate, uh, facility to uh, produce power. So let's compare to UK. In fact, in 2004, the situation in UK was completely different from France. 70% of the waste were going to landfill. It was a landfill country. Uh, uh, and if we compare to today, it was very similar to Romania. In Romania, you have 70% of the waste going to landfill. So uh, you see less than two decades, uh, the situation in UK was very completely different uh, from France. Uh, to catch up uh, with France, uh, they have a lot of work to do uh, to reduce this landfill. Why they have so many landfills is that they have a lot of clay quarries uh, to, to have their bricks. And then at the end of the life of the quarries, it's a very nice uh, landfill site. Uh, so it was very uh, easy and non expensive to use this old quarry. So how did they manage to close the landfill in, in UK? They have put in place so it's a different way from Germany, where there has been a ban. But in UK, they have decided to put in place a landfill tax. Initially, it was quite flat. It was around 10 pounds per ton. So one pound is about 1.1 euro, 1.2 dollars. Uh, it was quite flat. It, it was not moving very fast. We have built the first modern energy from waste plant in UK in 94. Uh, but uh, this regime was uh, of landfill was not very incentivizing uh, the market. But they have decided in 2004 to increase this landfill tax of eight pounds per ton every year during 10 years. Uh, and to, to have so 80, 80 pounds per ton uh, in 2014. And now it's with escalation. So in 2020, uh, the landfill tax is 94 pounds per ton. So all mo more than 100 euros per ton. Uh, and in the law, it's written that it will not decrease. And as they have put in the law directly in 2004, that they will increase with this slope, this landfill tax, it has given a very good visibility of the market. Uh, the private companies in UK were able to know that 10 years away, landfill will not be any more competitive because of this landfill tax. And with this visibility, and they know that it will not change because it was with escalation afterwards. And with this visibility, it was possible to go to a private uh, financing uh, and to uh, build facilities uh, to avoid uh, to be more competitive than uh, landfill uh, compared with this landfill tax. So in fact, the first 
solution, an easy solution, was to ask your neighbor. Uh, uh, of course, on the continent, we have, as we have seen, uh, a lot of energy from waste plants. So it was possible for UK to export a part of the waste on the continent. And this is what has happened. And it was following more or less the slope of the landfill tax. You could see here the landfill tax slope. And you could see here the increase of a prepared municipal waste going to the continent by boats after bailing, uh, mainly to Netherlands, uh, Sweden, uh, and Germany. Uh, and it, it has reached more or less 3 million tons of waste going to Valencia. Uh, it was an easy solution because there were a, a, a need of uh, waste, especially, for example, in Sweden and Denmark, to produce heat. Uh, and it was cheap at this time because the sterling was very high in value. But with a Brexit, so it was 1.5 uh, euros per uh, pound. But with a Brexit, it has been going down to 1.1. Therefore, he is not very happy because uh, it's not a good solution. It's not so uh, inexpensive solution. So they have to build facilities now. Uh, uh, and this is the solution, is to build facilities in UK. And during more than a decade, you, you could see the uh, waste market, the, the construction of energy from waste plant awarded by countries in Europe. Uh, and you see uh, in 2010-2019, in between the period 2010-2019, UK has been by far the first market for the construction of energy from waste. 44% of all uh, energy from waste plants built in Europe has been built in UK. And you see Sweden is number two, but with a much smaller and uh, France is number seven with 4% of the capacity awarded. So a very, very active market because of this uh, regulation. And the effect of that regulation was very, very impressive. Uh, there is a huge success. You could see the 70% of landfill that I have shown you at the beginning here in 2004. And it has gone down to 6 million tons of waste. And this success has been obtained by a mix between energy from waste, you could see there in blue, and material recycling and uh, composting here in green and orange. There has been also a decrease there. You could see this is the export of waste, the decrease of the total amount. But nowadays, this export is reducing and reducing because of the Brexit. Uh, another presentation of this uh, result, you could see there the landfill, which has been reduced by minus 75% in, uh, uh, in 15 years. Uh, and the mix uh, between material from waste and energy from waste to replace landfilling. Well, of course, this is meaning that most of the plants in UK are uh, less than 10 years old, as you could see on this graph. As you see, 8 million tons are uh, less than 10 years old because this is a brand new park that has been built. Some examples of plants that we have built there in British Islands. The first one I have told you was Cellship in London, which is uh, one mile away from Tower of London, built in 94. Uh, it was a merchant plant that we have built together with Veolia. And then a series of plants that we have built in the 90s and beginning of the 2000s. Uh, you could see there. Uh, and then there was a new after this regulation for landfilling, uh, beginning of 2010, there was uh, uh, a new period of construction of new plants. And we have built a number of plants for FCC, Veolia, Viridor, Cita, MVV, uh, Viridor, uh, and so on. Uh, and now we'll, we'll Liberator, which is a new client for us. And the last four ones that we are finishing to build, Park at Fair for Will Liberator, Avonmos for Viridor, Earlsgate uh, that we are starting for Covanta Bothwell, and uh, that we will operate also, and Lostock uh, uh, for the joint venture between CIP and FCC. 
Uh, in total, this is 24 uh, turnkey energy from waste facilities that we have built in British Islands, with a total capacity of 7 million tons, so 37 market. Uh, 37% market share. One difference between France and UK is that most of the plants uh, are under private concessions. So you could see this is the breakdown of our contracts by clients in the last uh, two uh, decades, so for, since 2000. 32% of the plants that we have built have been built for directly for municipalities in public tenders. But then you could see uh, important concessioners and private companies, especially in UK, so Veolia, Suez, Verido, Willebrator, uh, that are our clients, especially uh, uh, in UK. I know that my dear friend uh, Roland will present something else after me, uh, but this is our market share uh, in the uh, European countries where we are working, so excluding Germany and Switzerland where we are not working. Uh, so, uh, my friend Roland will uh, explain something else afterwards, but there are a few competitors working in this uh, topic, especially coming from Europe. So, you see the result uh, uh, in UK. Uh, in fact, the tendency is, is similar in Europe. You see a decrease of landfill, minus 31% between 2001 and 2016, replaced by energy from waste in orange, and recycling, plus 11% uh, waste energy in this period, and plus 19% recycling. So this is uh, recycling and waste energy are going hand in hand uh, to replace uh, uh, landfill. Uh, I remind you of the objective that uh, Edmund has told you initially. There is an objective of reducing landfilling down to less than 10% in 2035 in Europe. Uh, and to have a recycling up to 65%. So we have to continue this, uh, this road. I don't go too much in details with the technology that uh, Edmund has presented you. So this is, for example, the plant in Oxford. Uh, you could see the flue gas treatment is very different from the one uh, that Edmund has presented you because it's a dry system with lime and uh, a denox, which is done in non catalytic in the furnace. Uh, but the principle is rather uh, similar. Uh, so in, in this type of uh, plants, we have the combustion system. We are in partnership with Martin since 1961. And uh, then after the combustion system, we have furnace and the boilers produce the steam, then the steam power cycle and the flue gas uh, treatment. Uh, I will say a few words about alternative thermal treatment because there was uh, a promotion and experimentation of this alternative thermal treatment in UK with subsidies to promote this type of uh, technology, especially gasification. If you could produce thin gas with a good, uh, with a, a level of calorific value, you can obtain subsidies. Uh, you can have gasification on a grid. Uh, we have done together with Martin some experience. On a grid, if you stop the secondary air, you have incomplete combustion and you have gasification, and you could have a thin gas there. Uh, so it's a gasification, but it's also a state combustion. Like almost all the gasification we are, which are promoted by the market, especially in Japan. Uh, some of them are based on free dice bed, some of them are based on shaft furnace, and you have at the end thermolysis or pyrolysis if you reduce completely the air injection. You could have plasma assistance in free dice bed or in uh, uh, shaft furnace. But at the end, all this technology, uh, a very important difference with the great combustion is that they need preparation of the waste, which is always very difficult with residual mixed solid waste. So at the end, the technology which are used for residual municipal solid waste. So you could see here the figures for the number of plants in commercial operation over five tons per hour in all the continents. So it's, you see the great is more than 90%. Uh, a few fluidized bed, which is needing preparation, especially shredding, especially in, uh, in China there or with RDF. A few gasification, mainly in Japan, uh, and pyrolysis and very flu uh, plasma. In the last decade, uh, the plant awards 
you see 92% of the plants awards were based on traditional advanced grades that we are proposing uh, uh, together. 5% uh, fluidized bed and 3% uh, plus gasification or plasma gasification, especially in Japan or in uh, UK. In Japan, more than 90% of the plants are based on, on great system. The European Union, uh, through uh, via its uh, uh, science and knowledge service, GRC, has published this paper concerning waste energy technical potential. And they are saying that gasification, so this is official uh, paper from Europe administration. They say that its gasification have not been commercially proven to date even with extensive pretreatment of the waste to get the a better homogeneity. And this is very important point is that residual municipal waste is not homogeneous, it's variable. And that we have mean mainly costly failures of gasification and pyrolysis in Europe. There are a few plants working in Japan, but Japanese waste are very different. And at the end, uh, the few plants which are working, they are not, they don't have a higher efficiency in energy recovery. A very interesting example in UK uh, of failure is Tis Valley, which was uh, one of the largest plasma gasification. So it was, this slide was coming from the, uh, uh, the supplier of this plant, uh, Alpha Energy. So you could see here the gasifier with plasma. It has been built by, uh, by this company too, for air products. Uh, a, a huge facility, two times 300,000 tons. You see two, la two plants there. Uh, but in fact, uh, late 2016, uh, the newspapers were saying find a nail in the coffin of air product site. And air products has quit the market of energy from waste and has lost almost $1 billion on this plant, only this plant. So it was a huge technical disaster. It was absolutely not working. And they have lost this amount of money only six months after the beginning of startup. Uh, so uh, it was not working at all. And it's not the only failures in UK that we have seen with gasification. Energos uh, company has built four plants of a great transport system with gasification. They failed, NEAT with pyrolysis or Utotech with fluidized bed. Uh, they stop uh, to promote uh, this gasification uh, in UK. And now the subsidies are very reduced in UK. Uh, to go in this type of plants. Exactly at the same time in Tees Valley, we have built a non-alternative but an advanced energy from waste uh, in Wilton, uh, in Teesside. It's five kilometers away from Tees Valley, uh, at plasma gasification. And after three years of construction, it has been commissioned and it's working. It's 50 megawatt electrical like uh, normally with Tees Valley plasma gasification, but this one is working. Uh, it's non-alternative, but it's advanced. Uh, so sometimes uh, I take this uh, paper from the president of ISVA. Uh, we have a round wheel, it's working. Some people are trying to have a square wheel, uh, but it's not working properly. To finish, I will say a few words about greenhouse gases. A part of our energy is sustainable because we, are, we have biomass. Much more than 50% of energy produce is coming from biomass and therefore is uh, uh, it's bioenergetic and non-fossil, uh, so it's uh, renewable energy, and it has a very interesting impact on greenhouse uh, uh, gases. Uh, so let's take the example of UK. In fact, uh, in the nineties, waste sector, which is in orange there, you, so you could see uh, the greenhouse gas emissions in UK by sectors: power, industry, transport, building, and waste it was more than 9% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So it's not nothing. In general, we are talking only about industry or transport or, uh, or of course power, but not uh, about waste. And because of the construction of all the plants, it has been divided by four. You could see the curve there. Because landfill is uh, emitting a loft of methane, which is 25 times more, uh, uh, which has a warming potential 25 times more than CO2. And therefore uh, the landfilling of waste 
uh, has a huge impact on greenhouse gas emissions. And you could see it was 9% in UK. Now it's less than 3%. It has decreased. It has been divided by four. So it's a huge uh, uh, success there. And you could see there that they claim that the annual reduction of greenhouse gas emissions of the waste sector in UK was minus 9% per year during this period. And you could compare this to the increase of landfill tax of plus 10%. It's very similar. So it was very, very efficient policy uh, in 15 years to obtain uh, this result. Uh, this is not the only re uh, example of greenhouse gas uh, reduction. Uh, for example, Copenhagen uh, in Denmark uh, is claiming that in 2025, it will be the first CO2 neutral capital in the world with 100% renewable and recovery heat in district heating. Uh, and this district heating is representing 98% of the city's demand. Every citizen in Copenhagen is connected to district heating. And, and in Denmark, they have decided to stop completely fossil fuel uh, uh, boilers uh, to, uh, to, to do the heating for the city. And they have replaced coal-fired power plants uh, to, uh, to a brand new biomass plant, 500 megawatt thermal uh, wood boiler there, where we have supplied the flue gas condensation to have very high uh, energy recovery. So it's very similar to a small natural gas boiler uh, condensation, but it's a huge uh, plant. And the other plant for the waste, uh, uh, Amager, that I've shown you with a ski slope there. But it's very interesting also because we have flue gas condensation. So we recover all the heat coming from the, uh, the vapor in the flue gases uh, to have very high energy uh, efficiency. And so to finish, waste and energy is a part of circular economy. You could see there on this graph coming from this report from ISVA, uh, Circular Economy, Energy and Fuels. It's a part of the final sink of the circular economy. We have pollution in our waste and a good and the only thing to avoid this pollution and to take out all hazardous components in the waste uh, and to isolate them from biosphere is to have waste energy, which could be concentrate all this pollution. And it's very important to keep the circular economy clean. We need to protect the circular economy from hazardous substances. And we need this sub-financing and waste energy is uh, the solution to do that to have circular and to avoid uh, circular uh, pollution. So to conclude, in resume, you could see that the energy uh, from waste situation between UK and France are similar for a number of, plant, of uh, figures like population, the amount, the treatment share, total capacity, the great combustion technology as a standard. But it's very different because in fact, UK has caught up with France for energy from waste. So therefore the plant age uh, capacity uh, of a plant, the number of plants are different. It has been, and it's still a very active greenfield market. And with a Brexit, the market is still very important uh, compared to a, a few brownfield projects in France. It's different because it's private market. Uh, so you need to be competitive uh, compared to a uh, landfill. And this is the landfill tax uh, effect there. In France, we have uh, public tenders or private tenders as public service delegation. Uh, a point is that there are very few cogeneration in UK, uh, much less than in France, nevertheless, much less than in Denmark. There is some RDF export. We have an, another uh, type of RDF, which is CSR, but which is not very developed in France. And finally, there has been some promotion of alternative thermal treatment, but a lot of failures, and this experimentation is now uh, finishing. So, Finally, energy from waste is a very compact, clean and secure waste solution that you could install in urban areas close to city centers uh, and delivering a renewable energy uh, uh, and very good for to avoid uh, greenhouse gas emissions from uh, landfill. And just to finish, this is the example after the Copenhagen example. This is a very nice example of a plant which is in the city center. This is Monaco uh, in the south of France. Uh, Monaco is very famous, of course, for the prince, which is living there in this palace, for the aquarium, which is there, and for the Formula One circuit, which is around the arbor. But it should be also famous for this plant, which is there, which is the energy from waste. This is 
treating all the waste of the of Monaco, delivering heat, cooling, and electricity uh, to the uh, Principauté. And uh, most of the waste are going uh, by underground collection. So people, they don't even know that there is an energy from waste uh, facility there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Cordon, for our presentation. It was very, very, very nice. And I want to call now Roland Gray. You talk about uh, Roland. You talk about Itachi project. He's the senior sales director at Itachi Zose Nova. Uh, he's a Switzerland with 30 years of experience in project management and engineering in waste management in plant construction industry. Please, Roland Gray, it's your time. Okay. Bom dia a todos. And uh, thank you, Yuri, for uh, introducing me. And uh, thank you to Aprend to invite uh, Itachi Sosninova to this uh, webinar. I will have a bit of different topic. I will talk about uh, technical and commercial requirements for global uh, waste to energy or energy from waste solutions. So I will present uh, uh, the, the latest development most recent development in new markets and explain uh, the environment and, and the condition needed to, to realize projects. So that is the topic of my, of my presentation. So first introduction of the company, Itachi Sosni Nova. So we are based in, uh, in Switzerland. So I'm sitting in Switzerland, in Zurich right now in the office. Um, we are, have uh, subsidies in several countries. Germany, USA, UK, Slovakia, and France. And we are in total about more than 800 employees, uh, uh, almost 600 sitting here in, in, in Zurich, or uh, let's say having the pay on the pay, pay list on, uh, here in, in Switzerland. And we are more than 80 years in, in, this, in this business. Uh, we belong to a Japanese group. That's why we have our name, Hitachi Sosen. Uh, comes from our parent company, which is in Osaka and uh, Tokyo. And we know each other for a long time. So um, uh, Hitachi Sosen used our technology on a license basis since 1960 and built the plants in at the beginning in Japan, later in other Asian markets. So we, our original name was Fonro and we became part of that uh, big group in 2010. So to, today we are today we are together and cover the all energy from waste markets in the world. So our parent company mainly covers uh, the Asian markets, and um, uh, let's say we cover the rest of the world. Um, and uh, in some projects we uh, work together. Here you can see all well. I probably have not updated the latest latest project. It's changing so fast, especially the projects in China. So this is the, the project that we have delivered together uh, on a global basis. And you can see we have quite a nice uh, market share over the last uh, uh, decade in all these markets, in the global markets, energy and waste markets. All this is counted on on capacity basis. Not on, not on uh, order intake amounts or, or, or whatever, it's, it's capacity. So, I mean, we had heard about this uh, EU circular economy package, which is aiming to 65% recycling by uh, 2030. Um, so waste should be, well, separated, recycled, uh, uh, organic fractions uh, separated. Uh, we have their solution that is the anaerobic digestion to recover uh, the biomethane and uh, material as compost and liquid fertilizer from these uh, solutions. And for the non recyclable inorganic, mainly inorganic fraction or post recycling fraction, we have the thermal solution where we recover energy as power and heat and uh, material from, from this uh, waste, uh, waste of all these from the sources. Other material goes directly to recycling. Best is to recycle directly at the source, to separate at the source, 
and to bring it as a clean organic fraction to the AD plant or for uh, other recycling uh, uses. So as I said, we have the two solutions. We have the thermal solution shown here, multiple solid waste or RDF or CDR called in Brazil, uh, used to generate electricity or heat in the best case, if you have that possibility or process steam and recover materials from, from the input material. Organic fraction goes to our compost technology. So over there we have uh, food waste and um, uh, 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 green waste, which is digested in aerobic digestion. And uh, afterwards the gas, the biogas used to generate electricity. Uh, but in the best case, uh, to, to clean it, to, to upgrade it from biogas to biomethane. Also for that, we provide the technology. We have the technology in house as well for that. And use this biomethane as, as, a, as a combustible uh, to, to drive cars, trucks. So these are the two solution, main solution where that, that we have in our portfolio. Um, here a bit our solution in the context of renewable energy. So energy from waste in the bottom is uh, ba producing base load, covering base load, producing heat and electricity, uh, uh, same as other power plants. And then we have the anaerobic, anaerobic digestion where we can uh, produce energy on demand because we can store the, the biogas. And and then we have the fluctuating, uh, let's say, renewable energies uh, with, as wind power, solar power. And you have some periods, of course, where you produce too much energy that is electricity that is not needed at that time. So we have also solution for power to gas. So we use that excess energy um, in electrolysis, uh, produce hydrogen and take CO2 from the AD plants and energy from waste plants to produce uh, biomethane and this biomethane can then be used again if needed to produce power or to use it as a combustible. So you see we have the technology from energy from waste to thermal solution uh, the, for the biogenic fraction, the anaerobic digestion, power to gas to, to combine it and uh, gas upgrade, gas cleaning system to, to clean the gas from anaerobic digestion but also from from landfill or from, from other uh, sources. This is our core, te core technology. So it's our proprietary technology. You see here the whole uh, uh, combustion part here, the combustion section, the waste is fed into this chute, the boiler heat recovery here, and then flue gas treatment systems, residue handling and residue treatment so all this is, is our proprietary technology, which is implemented into, into a complete plant, into turnkey delivers. So we have our proprietary technology. And of course, uh, we, we need other technologies, which are not our own technology, but where we do uh, quite, um, uh, quite some engineering that is for energy use. That means the water steam cycle uh, part, a balance of blood, all these auxiliary systems, and electrical and control system. And on top, of course, you have the, the building civil works part where we do not do any engineering, that we just manage those uh, civil work packages and integrate everything in a, a complete integrated solution for turnkey uh, plants. So we are a technology provider, but um, uh, well, due to the recent development over the last 15 years, became more and more also an, an EPC contractor. This was mainly driven, as Christoph explained before, I think, uh, by, the, by the UK market where there was a high demand for, UK, uh, for EPC turnkey deliveries. So a bit about the international market development. Uh, here I'm sh just showing actually the Hitachi Zone Innova, the Zurich, Switzerland-based company. I do not show uh, the projects uh, managed and handled and delivered directly by our parent company. So you see in green, this was uh, for many, many years, our, our core market, Europe. Uh, as Christoph explained, the uh, UK was the most import important market over the last, I would say 15 years, at least 10 years. 
So we have just recently contracted there the plant number 13. Hopefully we will be lucky with that one. Um, and, and now it's a bit changing. I mean, UK is still a very, very important market, but the most recent developments we have are in, in other markets. So I will talk a little bit and explain the situation in, uh, in Turkey, in Istanbul, uh, the plant that is in construction right now. I will talk about uh, Russia, about the development in Russia, the four projects in, in Moscow and uh, the, the fifth project in Kazan. One of the newest, re most recent signed contracts is in Australia, the Rockingham project in uh, Western Australia with all the present that project and the environment, the project development of that project. And so these projects are all in construction. And I will also then come to, to Dubai, Middle East uh, countries, uh, talking about the most, the ongoing development and activities in the Dubai project. I will go a little bit to, 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 to Americas. I mean, in America, in the US, we basically have no energy from waste. So this was a market which was uh, not, not, not much happened there in the, in the last uh, in the years. But uh, now it became active in the renewable gas sector. So here we, I will present two uh, anaerobic digestion projects. Uh, the same in Sweden, just show it. And we have it even in China. So we're even delivering anaerobic digestion plants to China. China is also, uh, let's say maybe it's an important market, but a less important market for us. Most is handled direct, directly by the Chinese uh, companies. Uh, many of them have uh, uh, licenses from uh, European technology suppliers like us. But for the big plants, uh, we actually delivering the combustion grades from Europe to China for these plants. So you can see over the last, I think it's five years, we have delivered 50, 44 combustion grades for 14 energy from waste plants in China with a total capacity of 37,000 tons per day. Uh, the same, same in Thailand for one project. Smaller projects, they, they basically do everything by themselves or get it delivered from our Japanese parent company. Um, and um, and it, which is actually, which is a different grade, which is not that, that grade that we deliver here. This is a most, most better, well, most recent development that we deliver here. I will not show the project in India. We have also developed the project in India. We see also India as a, as a, as a, a good opportunity. Uh, there we have everything de developed locally, manufactured locally to 100%. So it's a, it's a low cost plant, every do everything done locally without us being directly involved in the execution from our headquarters in Zurich. Uh, Istanbul, that is the situation uh, in, in April. So Istanbul is, a, is an EPC job. So we deliver the, the plant as, a, as an EPC and technology supplier to the municipality. Uh, this project uh, started in September 2017. So uh, the, you see the main equipment is installed, boilers are installed. Uh, boiler pressure test was in March and April. And uh, now we are completing the water steam cycle, air-cooled condenser here, and the whole building. It's quite a special architectural design what, what, they, what this plant will have. Uh, so more details here. So this will be the, the largest uh, turnkey project ever awarded in Europe. It's uh, 1 million um, uh, tons a year. So a big plant. It will all then become the, the largest energy from waste plant in Europe. Um, we do the EPC together with a local partner, the Turkish partner company, Makio is a Turkish partner. So this is basically what we do in all the new markets. Of course, we team up with, uh, with partners, with partners that have uh, uh, local experience, of course. Uh, Makio is covering the, the civil works mainly, and together we do direction of all equipment. Uh, important to mention in this project is, this was a, a project initially covered 
by uh, supplier credit insurance by the Swiss Export Credit Agency, which is called SURF. Uh, you may know, I mean, there were some um, turbulences in Turkey in 2017-18, which made it necessary to, to find another way to finance during the project, to finance this project. So um, SURF supported this, this uh, new financing solution uh, long-term financing by, by a buyer credit insurance, uh, which was then implemented, I think, about a year ago. So this, this uh, buyer credit insurance, uh, uh, as you see, it covers the financing of Swiss export by domestic and foreign banks and financial institutions. So before it was financed, the financing was organized basically by the, the, the uh, Istanbul municipality. And, um, and we brought together this, with the help of uh, SERF another solution there to continue, which was very critical. I mean, we, were, we had an insurance, so in case we would not get paid anymore, we would have been compensated, but then the project would have been died. So this was the way to, to save this project and to continue. So now it's on a, on a good way and will be continued. Another uh, development, it's uh, in Russia, Moscow. So here we are talking about uh, four plants. You see in all directions, we have one plant. So the waste is collected in the city, going to transfer centers and then transported uh, to the four uh, uh, energy from waste plants. So these plants are all in the, in the Moscow region, which is called Oblast, not in Moscow city. So they're around the city because you cannot build in Moscow, you cannot build new plants in the city quite big plants. The first plant uh, we got awarded in uh, end 2019. And the second project was just started uh, this April. Here, the environment is very different. I mean, this is mainly di driven, this project is mainly driven by the Russia's energy strategy for, uh, for renewable energy sources which had the target to have 4.5% uh, by 2020, but with renewable resources. I don't know where they are with this target actually. So as, as the project started a little bit later, most likely this, uh, this uh, target will be reached later. So what they introduced is a so-called capacity payment. So this plant this can generate uh, 70 megawatt. So for the 70 megawatt installed, you get paid you get paid at the green tariff for 15 years of operation. It doesn't even matter what you produce. You can even produce a bit less. So you get paid by the installed capacity, not by the power output from the plant. This is a, a DBFO project. So uh, we designed it, built it, um, uh, um, and it's financed by, by our, by our um, um, client, which is an SPV, and we will also part, participate in the beginning in the operation of the project. Um, this project, I think that it's very special here, it's called this investment, uh, this so-called investment agreement. So there is a fixed tariff uh, for gate fee and the waste amount, the quality is, is guaranteed by, the, by the, the, the municipality, by the government also for the 50 years of operation. So here in this project, we, we don't act as an EPC contractor. It's also a quite challenging market to be in Russia. So here we're providing our, let's say our technology, the key equipment that I have uh, presented in a, in a previous slide. And the power is, is sold to, to the market. So there is no, no special uh, power purchase agreement. So it's sold to the, to the wholesale market. Uh, now we jump very far away. Now we go to Australia. Here we have something similar that um, what we heard before uh, from the UK. So they have, land, have introduced landfill taxes called here landfill levy rates. And they have uh, different rates uh, from depending on the region. What is shown down here is from Western Australia. It's here. It's here is Perth, Perth region. 
So uh, this this is today at uh, at uh, 70 uh, Australian dollars, which is about well, close to to 50 US dollars today, and will increase uh, in in the next year each year, each year by well, it's not decided yet by um, uh, 10 or 18 uh, Aussie dollars. So that's why you have these uh, green extras here on top, depending if they go to the high amount or the lower amount. Other regions like uh, Southern Australia here, this port huh, in Adelaide, they are they are currently at about uh, 75 US dollars. And uh, in Sydney, Sydney area, New South Wales area, they are already at, uh, uh, well, about 100 US, US dollars here, this level here. So this was the driver for this project. So similar to the, to the UK market. Um, and because of that, I mean, here on the bottom, you see also today the average landfill cost in Western Australia, huh? so this part, is around 100, uh, a bit more than 100 US dollars. And the project that where we were contracted, that we developed, is in this area, in the Perth area here. So also this project is a, is a DBFO project. We as HDI actually uh, started to, no, we, we did not start, we were invited in 2016 to, to join the team, which was New Energy Corporation and Tribe Infrastructure to, to join the, the, the development team and continue the development. Um, in 2018, um, I think it was in, um, in January, we signed uh, uh, or we won a competition for a first waste contract, uh, and then from that point on, we we continued the, the development of the project until the financial close of this project in uh, in uh, January this year. So it took us two years from uh, signing waste contracts to have a financial close uh, and start to build the plan to realize the project. So here, this project we're doing also with a partner. Here we, we joined with uh, Axiona later then, and, and we built together as an EPC team uh, this plant. Here, the, I mean, the, the context is a bit too complex to, to explain all the details. It, it's very, uh, very complex. I mean, we have this 20 years base contract, mm -hmm. the one that I mentioned before. Um, but there are several there in total, there in total four different waste contracts, no, three waste contracts actually. Uh, one even with the operator, which is uh, together with us, Suez. We will also deliver part of the waste. And, and about one third is, is, uh, is acquired on the market. Uh, but the other waste have, have 20 years contract duration. There is also a, a, a contract for 20 years for the incineration bottom ash to use uh, to be used in uh, in in, uh, in in road construction to as aggregate. So there's also a contract with a company that is using that uh, material to build roads, and then there is a eight years power purchase ag agreement with the industrial offtaker. Uh, the numbers about gate fee and uh, and uh, electricity price are confidentials. But for you to understand in what level we are, I have here the, the wholesale market price of electricity. So this is the price of today. And if you see the, the landfill cost here, you can also guess where, where the gate fee of, of that, um, for that plant is actually paid to this plant. But the numbers, the official numbers are, are confidential, so I cannot show, but it's done on, the, on that level. So it's a very, I mean, at the end, we have to maybe close about, I think it was more than 20 contracts to, to come to the financial close. So, and, and you're doing that all at the same time. So you can imagine people involved in, in such developments, in such financial closing are, um, are very busy. So it's, a, it's a very tough. So you're basically on, well, 24 hours, four weeks, um, and uh, very tough to close all these contracts at the same time. So here we actually are on three levels. So Hitachi is on the SPV level. So we own part of that plant with a minor share. We are in the EPC team and we, together with Axiona and together with Suez, 
we will also uh, operate that plan. So we are at all, all levels uh, involved in this project, which is quite difficult then just to be a technology or EPC uh, supplier. Uh, this project is, uh, is not yet in execution. Here we are actually in this phase where we are uh, uh, aiming to the financial close. Um, uh, very challenging. Uh, many, many people involved in that project. Uh, well, we will, the expectation for sure is that we will close it this year. In the best case, uh, uh, already in September, I would say. So this is a this is a, a different setup. This is a BOT project. So uh, we will build the plan will be built, operated, and then transferred after 35 years to the Dubai municipality. So this will be the largest resource recovery facility uh, worldwide. Actually, it's huge. It's if you see the numbers here. It's, uh, it's about almost 2 million tons per, per year, and which is very impressive because, I mean, I think in Dubai, uh, I think a bit more than 3 million people, people are living in Dubai. So it's a lot of waste what they're generating. And unfortunately, there is no, no separation, no recycling at all. So in this plant, really all the waste will go to, the, to, the, to, the, to this facility. Maybe this will change in the future but will currently be, will not be the case. So here also we were part of the development team. So we developed that project together with partners and we will together with also an experienced company in that region from Belgium, but has a lot of experience in the Middle East, uh, uh, be the EPC together and also the O&M team operating this plan for 35 years. It's a very high efficient plant. I mean, temperatures are high in Dubai. I mean, now in the summertime, you can get, I think, up to 50 degrees. So incredible hot, so you cannot really go outside. And uh, nevertheless, but of course, at the lower temperature, we can generate up to 194 megawatt of electricity. So it's a big plant. So you can also invest a lot in the in the very, very high efficient turbine. and that's, uh, a uh, power plant turbine, a two flooded turbine, uh, which allows you to have to reach such high um, um, efficiency rates. I compare that with, uh, with another project on a much, much bigger place actually for Mexico City. Uh, this slide is in, in Spanish, but I think you can understand. So this is the amount of waste that the Mexico City is generating per day. Um, and they're doing quite well today. So they already separate, they separate organic fraction to, uh, to for composting. They separate the recyclable fractions, actually, actually during the collection they're doing that. And then they have some separate mechanical separation and some different waste fraction what they separate. So the remaining fraction is actually this 8,600 8, tons per day which goes today still to landfills, several landfills around the Mexico City. Also not in the city area, of course, or the, in the city. Uh, so uh, that's a lot of a big amount. Uh, almost the same amount, a, big, a bit more amount, a bit more than what is going to the Dubai plant. So, and for this waste, it was intended to build an energy from waste plant for part of it, actually for 5,000 tons per day. So uh, the rest should be then uh, uh, reduced by further recycling and by further separation of organic fractions. So actually out from this 8,600, so another 3,600 was the, is the plan to be separated as organic fraction or as recyclable materials. And then the remaining, so uh, let's say about 40%, uh, less than 40%, 35% of the total waste amount would then go to this plant. So this would this plant would then treat all the non-recyclable, post-recycled waste in Mexico City. So it was intended to be well, probably the first plant in Latin America. Unfortunately, this project is on hold. So the the development started already in uh, 
2015, the race competition, the competition for the concession in 2060, and the concession agreement, the so-called CPS, the service contract was closed in, in 2017. And then we worked towards the financial close. Uh, so we were not really ready, but almost ready, almost finalized by the end of 2018. But um, you may know that there were elections. So a lot of projects have been put on hold. And uh, well, we will see when we will continue. Hopefully we can continue. Eventually, the, 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 well, there might be some changes, but actually this contract is still in force. So this concession agreement with the city is still in place. It's also a big facility. I mean, this is very important for this kind of project. I mean, to make it viable. I mean, you have to think big. I mean, it, it would be very, or even more challenging to, in all these places that I have presented to, to realize small plans. So this is also quite a big plant, also high electrical efficiency. And as I said, they have these contracts. I mean, our client has a contract for, for 30 years of operation. So, and we would also together be the local partner, be the EPC contractor delivering that the project to our client, which is Thermo WTE. Um, uh, Mexican companies and uh, also participation uh, of uh, Veolia. What is the key for this project is actually the, the, the way it is set up, I mean, the, the conditions. I mean, the city budget will be unchanged because what the city today pays to, um, to bring the land, the waste to, land, to the landfills, which are not owned by the city, and to buy power electricity for the subway system. So the same amount of money is available for the operator, for the owner and operator of this plant. So the city budget would not be, would not be changed, it would remain the same. I show you here some, some numbers here. So I mentioned this contract, this service contract called CPS. So it's for 30 years. And for this amount of waste, for this amount of energy delivered, so all is included in this in this contract service contract. The plant itself will produce a bit less, a bit more. Sorry, will produce can can have a higher throughput, can produce more gigawatt hours, which be, will be sold to the to the market. So at the fee, what they would receive, what the city had to pay, is 130 million US dollars per year for that service. And this payment, and this is also very important, was also guaranteed by a, by a governmental fund. So this makes it actually pretty, pretty simple and safe to, to finance uh, such a project. So you can, you can also calculate what it means, uh, what the cost per ton per waste is. Uh, assuming a certain cost for the landfill. I mean, the current landfill cost in Mexico is probably around 20 US dollars. So if you would calculate that, if that's throughput, you would have a kind of electricity price of around 100 US dollars. Um, if, if it would be paid by the electricity itself, but it is a, it's, it's, a, it's an amount paid in, in, uh, in monthly rates uh, guaranteed for 30 years. So here's just shortly main the, the our development in renewable gas and orbic digestion. California is very active in this uh, in this um, in this uh, uh, using of uh, the greenhouse waste. Also here it's our development. We have developed that project and we operate it and we own it. A smaller project, of course, we could not do that for energy from waste plants, where the investment is at least a factor 20 higher than it is for this kind of uh, plants. Uh, we have done the same in, in Sweden. That is the second project. The first project was a, an EPC delivery, and we have acquired a company there already having an aerobic digestion plant, and we will replace it with a new project, uh, which is also in construction right now. Uh, in, in China, I mean, we also we're working together with uh, with uh, um, German Bioenergy, delivering the technology for um, 
anaerobic digestion plant in China. Uh, as a moment, as I showed in the previous slide, this is the this is this was the first project. And uh, in total, we have currently three projects in, in China to already delivered or being uh, delivered. Here, this is a bit to summarize what I, what I showed in all the projects before. So the revenues from for the project can be very different. You see here a project where most revenue comes from electricity sales and where you have quite a low revenue from, from the gate fee and the waste delivered. And of course, you can always have some generate some revenues from the metals, ferrous and non-ferrous metal that you separate. Here in this project, I mean, it's all in the concession. So you get paid a fixed amount and you have some extra uh, income from, from the metal sales and other, let's say extra energy that you're generating or electricity that you're generating or extra amount of waste that you that you take to the plant. In other project here, it's uh, you have this, uh, it's obvious which project it is of course, it's uh, the capacity payment. So you have a fixed tariff paid by the government and then you, you sell the electricity to the, to the wholesale market and have a, have a small, portion gate fee. Actually, in, in, in most projects in Europe and also in this project in Australia, typically it's the other way around. I mean, two thirds of the revenues are typically coming um, from the gate fee and one third is from power sales. So th this means every project is different and has a completely different environment and um, but it, 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 it can work in, in, in different ways that is, that is shown here. So these revenues, of course, this, this is uh, what you get here. Then you have the, the operating cost. I mean, you have the fixed operating cost for the workforce, administration, all this. Then you have the variable work, uh, operating cost. It's the consumables, uh, the residue disposal, and the maintenance cost. And of course, you have the financing cost. This can have a very big impact. So you can imagine the financing cost, for example, in, in, in Mexico City project is not the same as in a Dubai project, uh, a, a big difference. And uh, this can have a big impact. So uh, actually uh, at the end, what you need here, the net waste treatment cost, this is what has to, to be covered by the gate fee or by subsidies or concession payments. So of course, this, this can make a diff big difference here. What is finally needed as a, as a gate fee or subsidy to make this uh, make a project uh, viable. Uh, what helps a lot is and that we have in this project here in Switzerland, if you have the possibility to not only produce electricity, but also to use uh, the heat the steam in nearby industry. Here it's used in a, in a paper mill. So by doing this, you can use 75% in this case of the energy in the waste and uh, generate revenues for your project. So this helps a lot. I mean, in other places, in, 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 in not unfortunately not in the UK, but in Switzerland, in, in Scandinavia, um, uh, all plants are producing power and heat for district heating purposes. And of course, this cannot be used. You could also even produce a district cold. Uh, there is a plant in, in Spain, Barcelona, which is doing that for the nearby um, office buildings, uh, producing uh, uh, in a centralized uh, cooling system, the, the cooling of those buildings. I mean, here's a bit to summarize what is really needed to, to make a project happen. I mean, there must be some incentive subsidies uh, or some political decisions to, to make this kind of projects happen. I mean, we heard already about uh, the solution in, in, in the UK, which started with a very low uh, uh, landfill tax, which was increased to a very high uh, landfill tax today. So this, this, this uh, caused all this development. This was the driver 
to develop all these projects in the UK in the last 15 years. Uh, the same happened in Australia, where we have today, depending on the region, uh, gauge fees or so, of 48 to 100 dollars. Uh, Israel is doing something similar. I mean, they have collected the uh, landfill landfill taxes over several years, so they have a, 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 a fund now with this money, and now they start to build plants. So there will be public tenders. Uh, the pre-qualification uh, is ongoing now for the first project. So they have plans to build five projects within the next ten years. And then another maybe five projects for the for the years to come, and this money will be available as a grant uh, for the winner of that competition. So that company that will use the lowest grant, so the lowest money, uh, the yeah the lowest grant subsidy from from the the government will win that competition. So you could get up to seventy percent, I would expect, of the capex of the cost of the plant as a grant from the government. And this ground, as I said before, was filled by the, the landfill taxes collectors uh, in, in over the, I don't know, 10 years, maybe. Uh, other, other countries, I mean, we heard that before, also Germany, uh, many EU member states, also Switzerland, had landfill bans. So there was not, no other solution. So you had to do something else with your waste. There is this, uh, this capacity payment, this, uh, this green tariff in, in, in Russia, in Moscow. Mexico City, also special model. I mean, there it's not the, 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 the market price uh, to, to sell energy. It's actually the, 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 the price to buy energy, which is the basis for, for the concession fee. Uh, grants I already mentioned. Also in Australia, we had a very small grant for that project, but it was only in the range of maybe 5% of the capex. Uh, important also in many places, uh, especially it also the case in Russia, it would also be the case in Brazil, especially uh, preferential tax treatment to get some tax reductions, very important. Attractive funding solutions. So I mentioned this uh, ECA, Export Risk Export Credit Agency covered uh, um, uh, finance, financing or green investment funds could also be an attractive solution to to make a project viable. And then of course, governmental support and governmental guarantees. Uh, well, I don't go into detail. This is just to show this the typical structure. So I mentioned here the, 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 the developer of the project. Well, actually those here up here are the, the sponsors or the developers of the project and they will have, hold the shares in the, the special purpose company here. And as I said, in some project, we are in Dubai also, in Rockingham, we are here on that level. We are together with a partner, the EPC contractor, and we are also the, the operator, together with a partner for, for those projects. And you need a lot of other contracts. I mean, here you can only see here's the waste, here's the power purchase agreement, uh, maybe agreements uh, for the residue. Um, so very complex. So you at the end, you have easily, let's say between, 12 and more than 20 contracts to be to be managed and to be closed and negotiated at the same time. So very complex. And this is basically the same thing, whether it's BOT, BOO, DBO, it's, it's about this similar setup actually. Here, here a little bit to, to explain the, the, the use of the funds. I mean, you, you have here the, the capex of the plant uh, the financing cost, which can vary a lot. Um, and you need some, you have the development cost and a certain reserve uh, that you need because, well, because of some unexpected reasons. So this in, in total is, is the, 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 the cost of the project. And then on the financing side, uh, also depending on, on the conditions, I mean, um, it can vary a lot. It can be uh, the equity that you need from 20 to maximum, I would say 40%. I've never seen, seen 40%. So typically you are more in the range of 25 to 30% as equity. And then the rest is, is, is financed by ECA covered debt, uh, multilateral banks, financing institute by development banks, uh, institutional investors and um, incentive programs. So this is more or less the, 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 what, what, you, what you will need to, to finance the project. 
So this is this is the the the, the key factors which uh, have an influence in the bankability of the project. So at the end, you always take, talk to the lenders. So they bring most of the money. So they don't want to have the risk. So they want to have a, a clear allocation of the risk. And this is typically transferred to the EPC and, and to the, to the O&M contractor. So it's, it's very, I mean, we can go through it. I mean, of course, the, the legal environment, of course, uh, is, is very, very relevant. I mean, is a risk, um, yeah, case of risk uh, management. Um, it, it must be a well-defined remuneration scheme for the gate fee, for the, the, the residue payment, uh, well-defined term for waste management services, a uh, very clear definition of the waste of the quality also as well, because the quality, I mean, if you get, you get the amount of waste, but not the heating value that you were expecting or that you had uh, agreed, uh, then you cannot generate the same amount of electricity, of course. So here it's also a deliver or, or pay, pay condition for, for this part. And of course, the counterparts are relevant uh, in, this, in this aspect. Then you need uh, long-term uh, offtake agreements, uh, as I mentioned before, for power residues. Also here, the counterpart, the quality of the counterparts is, is relevant. Here it's also a take or pay contract. So if they don't take, they have to pay anyhow, as here. If they don't deliver, they have to pay. Uh, then of course, you need uh, the uh, approved technology, which we have. I mean, uh, Christoph mentioned that, what the proof the technology is and the uh, experienced uh, contractor because uh, uh, banks or lenders will not like to do that with someone that has not real experience and not a good track record in building a plant. And the same goes for the, for the operator of, uh, for the, of the plant, of the O&M contractor, also very relevant. And of course, at, at the end, you must have a, a, a economical viable project. So here you can see it again, I mean, this high risk, low risk uh, technology, mature proven technology, very relevant um, plant construction, ex experience contractor that has a good track record and technology. So here it is really, because at the end you will have this lenders, lenders advisor, technical and legal advisors looking into all these details and um, finally decide whether you get the financing of such a project or not. So if you have the wrong partners, if you do not have a strong team here, you will fail at the end and you will not get the financing. Construction of this plant is quite complex. So here's a project in the UK. We have built it two units first and another two units, to totally 480 megawatt fuel input replacing a cold fire power plant, which is just behind that side. Uh, very complex and you see the duration uh, mentioned above. So you, it takes above around at least 42 months to build such a plant. And you can also build it in the middle of the city. This is a plant in Paris. So the Eiffel Tower is just to the right, about three kilometers from this location. This, to realize this plant, it took even more time, very complex. It's two, two thirds below the ground just at the river sand, so very complex uh, civil works construction here. But here we delivered only the technology, we did not deliver the complete plant. So to get an idea about uh, the overall time frame to develop and build the project, I have mentioned some information here. I mean, you have the first step there where you need to define the project, you have to find the light, right side to build it. You must have some uh, feasibility studies. Then you typically have a, a public procurement process, public tenders. Uh, you need time to, to prepare the, the tenders. And you finally, uh, if you're lucky, you get the waste contract or the concession agreements. And, and then it's, it, it is not over. I mean, you cannot immediately start to build the plan. Then you need uh, all the, the the agreement, all these contracts that I mentioned before, the, the environmental licensing, the permitting. And once you have all these documents together, so you will uh, invite the, the lender's technical and legal advisor. So you do not typically not choose them by yourself. So the lenders or so the banks will, will choose that, but you will pay for it. 
and uh, and that is another process you must have a find finally the green light uh, up to until you come to the financial close and can start the construction so here in this case i would expect the total duration from let's say first activities until the plant is in commercial operation of around nine years and don't forget which is very important the development cost i mean to develop for all these stages here only the external cost you can well you should consider about 10 at least 10 million us dollars to be spent over this period means if you do not come to the financial close you will lose that money but it is only external costs so on top of that you have only the internal cost so the cost from us as an epc contractor or an end contractor from the sponsors so all the all these involved parties have internal costs which is not considered here this is really only to to pay the external also to pay this uh, lenders technical legal advisor which can be very expensive and all this is at the end recovered under the project budget so this is what i said I showed before this will be part of the the financing thank you for your attention Thank you, Roland, for our presentation. It was very nice. And now uh, I will give the word to the debaters. He, they will ask some questions. Uh, the debate is, it will be Flavio Matos, waste management expert with uh, 15 years in the environment and energy sectors, members of a brand's board of advisors and secretary manager of WTA to Brazil. He's a member of ISO Working Group Energy Recovery, Master in Environment and Energy Institute minus Telecom France, Master's in Management, Polytechnic University of Madrid, Spain, and PG in Project Finance, Middlesex University UK, and BSc in Mechanical Engineer, uh, UFU Brazil certificated by ISO International Waste Management. And next, we ask for Antonio Bolognese. He's graduated in electrical engineer from Escola de Engenharia Mauá. He's a specialist in thermoelectric generation from UPSCI and MBA in energy business from the São Dom Cabral and master in administration from PUC Minas. He's the CEO of BSG Valori, SA and upper main engineering and consultoria LTDA, project in business development companies in the energy and waste area. He has worked for 40 years in the electric, electrical sector and he's a professor of GVSP with a postgraduate degree in the area of infrastructure. And he's the vice chairman of the board of Brand. And we're asking for the, the third debater, Rubens Herbert IB. He's the vice president of Brazilian Association for Energy Recovery from Waste, a brain. First Secretary of Waste to Energy Research and Technology Council, WTRT Brazil. He's the Brazilian citizen, citizen uh, bachelor engineer in chemistry from ETH Zurich, and experience on financing in environment sectors in UBS, ABB, and WWF. Please, Flavio, have the word, please. Thank you, Yuri. Uh, thanks to uh, a lot to uh, all the speakers, uh, Mr. Fleck, uh, Mr. Gray, and uh, Mr. Cordon. Uh, the presentations have been uh, very, very much interesting. Uh, I do hope they will help uh, make uh, people in Brazil uh, understand the importance of uh, waste to energy technologies uh, as part of a sustainable uh, waste management uh, system. So uh, on my side, uh, I'd like to mention that um, in Brazil, there are lots of myths around uh, these uh, waste to energy uh, technologies, huh? uh, as in many other countries uh, where this has not yet been implemented, um, and even those where, where, where it has. Um, these myths are usually promoted by associations that, uh, that fight wa waste to energy, but also land fuel owners. Uh, um, and one of the beaten, uh, old beaten arguments they, they keep repeating uh, in Brazil and uh, also as elsewhere uh, is that most of municipal uh, waste should be recycled and composted 
and it would be an absurd to promote their destruction with uh, waste to energy technologies. Well, we know that the ultimate goal of a perfect uh, waste management system is to recover uh, all the recyclable materials, to compost uh, uh, the organics, and then to limit uh, to a very uh, minimal amount the rejects that uh, uh, would be finally disposed of uh, in, in landfills. However, uh, in order to reach that, uh, municipality must uh, first implement, uh, first of all, selective collection, uh, which is not the case uh, very much in Brazil, uh, for all different waste streams uh, on households. Uh, so once this is in place, uh, the population must also be educated uh, and uh, separate the recyclables and uh, the right uh, dedicated uh, bins. Uh, and finally, there should be a major uh, manufacturing market uh, to purchase and reuse all the materials that uh, have been sorted, uh, which requires uh, very high quality uh, materials, uh, as we know. Um, the recycling chain presents uh, significant uh, technical, social, economic uh, barriers, uh, for instance, uh, if you assume uh, a given municipality uh, provides uh, separate collection for 70% of the municipal solid waste, uh, then 70% of the citizens do the correct uh, separation. And then finally, we have 70% of the materials that are actually uh, recovery, recovered into the production chain. So if you make 70% times 70% times 70%, it gives only 34% of materials that would actually be recovered into the production chain. Then the remaining above 60, 66% of these uh, rejects would still require a, a, a final destination. Uh, and we know that according to the waste management uh, hierarchy, uh, energy recovery has uh, clearly the priority over, over landfills. Uh, also, uh, if we look at the latest uh, figures from, from Eurostat, uh, which is the uh, European uh, statistic uh, body, uh, it indicates that Germany thermally treats around 31% of its waste, uh, while almost 67% is recycled or composted. Uh, while in Switzerland, you have 48% more or less uh, thermally treated and uh, about 52% recycled or composted with almost zero landfilling of non-pre-treated uh, waste. So Mr. Cordoma has also showed that since uh, 2001, uh, Europe has increased the uh, recycling rates from, from around 30% to 50%. Uh, while uh, waste to energy rates uh, have increased from 15 to 25 percent. Uh, and landfilling had been, has been dramatically uh, reduced uh, during the same period, uh, down from 55 percent to 25. So I'd like to hear uh, both from Mr. Fleck and uh, Mr. Grail, uh, how such rates of uh, recycling and composting have been possible with so much thermal treatment, both in Germany and uh, Switzerland. Uh, if we were to believe these uh, waste to energy opponents, uh, it would be very, very difficult to understand uh, their, their, uh, these numbers. So if you could give us uh, an explanation of that on your respective countries, I uh, would very much uh, appreciate. Thanks a lot. Well, if I can uh, take the start, Edmund Fleck here. I mean, the rates that are being reported for Germany on recycling are in some ways a little bit misleading because of the way of, calcul of the calculation has been done in Germany in the past. They did not really re uh, calculate what is being recycled in the sense of really going back into the material cycle, but the recycling rate published was a recycling where it was material that went into some recycling process. This will change with the new circular economy law uh, passed in Europe. And um, so the numbers will change somewhat. Compo on the other hand, if we look at waste management uh, from the beginning, I mean, a lot depends on our own behavior. Waste is not coming from somewhere magic. It's coming from all of us, from, our, from us as citizens. Our behavior of consuming, 
our behavior of what we, what we want as products, et cetera. So we are in a lot of ways responsible for the waste that is being created. There's a lot of materials that are very composite that contain different material types, which are easy maybe to manufacture, but very difficult to separate afterwards into fractions that then really co go back into the material cycle. There's things like paper where it's known that they can be recycled only a certain number of times and the fibers are too small, so they have to be taken out of the circle. There's some material that reaches its end of lifetime. So I think a lot depends on our own behavior. A lot depends on a sorting at the source from us. Materials like organic material that uh, can then be composted and make a quality compost that can be reused. You can make a lot of so-called compost uh, from, um, from mixed municipal solid waste, which cannot be reused. So it's of no use in the end. We as an industry, as, as a waste energy industry, we are not up for numbers of capacity. We are saying we treat whatever is not recyclable, whatever society in the end leaves to avoid landfilling this material. So to recover the energy contained in the material, we are not at all uh, promoting capacity as such. And we can deal with a lot of different types of waste, a lot of different waste fractions and compositions. The technology that we have is very versatile, very flexible. We don't need certain materials in the waste stream. We can live with whatever is left in the end. So we are absolutely not against recycling. Um, we are against landfilling. That's the main point. And the numbers, as uh, was pointed out earlier in Germany and, and across all Europe, they are, the trend I think is clear. Thermal treatment and uh, recycling is not, uh, co uh, is complementary, it's not contradictory. The numbers itself might be, might be diffi difficult or different in the past because of different ways in different countries to count them. They might become more comparable in the future when the new circular economy law takes place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I would like to, to give the word to Antonio Boloense, please. Uh, Yuri, can you maybe uh, let Roland uh, speak about the case of Switzerland? Yeah. Yeah. Please speak. Okay, Roland. Have the word, please. I mean, what, what we do in Switzerland, we, we, we just bring material to the recycling that is separated at the source. So only what is separated in, in the industry, in, in, the, in, the, in the restaurants, um, at your home, that is uh, going to the recycling industry. So what is once mixed together doesn't go to recycling anymore. There are few, very few exceptions in, in, in some parts of Switzerland, but we just separate. And this is, I mean, this is a long story. I don't know exactly when it really started, um, most likely more than 30 years ago, maybe separating paper, cardboard, then glass. And today we are separating, I don't know how many fractions, electrical waste, uh, batteries. So this is a, is a long process coming to, to a, such a high recycling rate. So it, it needs uh, education. People have to get used to it. And still to get today, I mean, you can still see people that do not really separate, but most of the people do because if they separate uh, this fraction that go to recycling, they reduce their cost to for the waste disposal because all this fraction that you can either bring back to the shop to a recycling place or did that are collected in front of your house of your apartment this is free of cost also the organic but what you put in the remaining the remaining waste which is go to the combustion plant to the energy from waste plants for that you have to pay you pay a buyback that you put into the, the container uh, you have to pay. It's about uh, for 35 liters. It's different from place to place, but it's around four, four to five US dollars per 35 uh, uh, liter bag. And this this helps to to come to these recycling rates. Uh, just by the by by your purse. I mean the people don't like to pay, so they separate waste. And but this this took a long time. So this is not something that you can implement and you have in place from one day to the other. So I think we, if you if you start increasing your recycling rate and what you should do for for sure, you should you should not wait or you cannot wait 
uh, to 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 build solutions to 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 treat waste that is non-recyclable, uh, or it, if not, you, it just goes to the landfills, and this is definitely worse for our environment, for our global global climate. So you have to develop both at the same time. That, that's great. Thank you, Roland. Uh, please, Antonio Belias. Okay, thank you very much uh, for all the speakers, Mr. Fleck, Mr. Cordon, Mr. Bale. And um, uh, here in Brazil, we are fighting a, a good war for several years and uh, trying to bring to, to Brazil uh, new technologies to treat uh, waste. And uh, as we could see, and in all presentations, uh, there are several uh, ways to treat uh, waste as uh, composting, recycling, uh, thermal treatments, uh, landfill, uh, producing RDF, and uh, several others uh, options. Unfortunately, uh, here in Brazil, we are still uh, almost landfilling uh, of uh, our waste. Uh, we are recycling only 3%. And uh, the, the, the part of the, the landfill, it's not only uh, exactly landfilling. We are landfilling only 66, uh, 56%, more or less. The other part, uh, we are uh, putting in a dumping ground uh, almost uh, 20%. And uh, uh, the other 20%, more or less, we are uh, putting in the, the wrong and the bad landfilling way. Uh, okay, it's, a, uh, it's very important for, for us to, to have the, the, uh, the experience from, from the Europe here in Brazil, because uh, uh, the people, the majority of the people, uh, is, don't understand uh, what what uh, what happens to to, to the the, um, the waste, and uh, I I was glad to to hear from the uh, the green people from Germany uh, that uh, they they agree that uh, waste to energy is a good way to treat uh, to treat the waste, and um, including. Uh, Mr. Mr. F uh, Mr. Fleck uh, said that uh, uh, MBT uh, or mechanical biological treatment is not uh, uh, a complete treatment. It's uh, like an intermediate uh, treatment and the, the green people agree with this. It's very important because uh, there, there are a lot of people that has a, a, a wrong uh, idea about MBT. Then uh, uh, I'd like to know from Mr. Fleck, uh, what's the uh, your view on the effectiveness uh, of MBT or uh, for MS MSW without separate collection as it's currently uh, the case in Brazil? Open, open the microphone for two uh, okay, okay. minutes, please. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, well, as I said, this was the big hope in the 1990s, uh, early 2000, that MBT would be a sensible solution compared to incineration, because as I said before, incineration was not wanted. So MBT was looking because it has the name of mechanical and biological. Um, but the, the, the essence for me is um, MSW, is containing a lot of different materials and a lot of different materials that are polluting, potentially polluting our environment if they are released. So somehow you have to contain these pollutants. That's why we as citizens have to deliver our MSW to the community to treat it properly. I mean, we are not the owners of this waste. We have to give it to them. As it has shown, I mean, MBT is you can mechanically separate some of the materials that has not been selected at source, 
like metals and some glass can be selected prior to, uh, to the MBT process. But then um, you have this process itself, which basically you're converting some of the carbon into heat, into energy, thereby driving off some of the water, but that's about what is happening. So you're still ending up with a high calorific fraction, which co still contains, as I said, a lot of the pollutants. So you don't really solve the issue. As you said, Mr. Bolognese, it's a pretreatment, it's an intermediate step, but not the final solution. The solution that was envisioned, envisioned in Germany was to bring it to a, use it as a fuel. But unfortunately, the uh, users that were intended did not like it in the end for various other reasons. Cement industry was afraid of contaminating their product with some pollutants. The coal industry was, was afraid of uh, corrosion in their plants because of the high steam parameters and the high chlorine content. So today in Germany, MBT is an intermediate that is running out because the issue is you have a high calorific fraction which has to be incinerated. You cannot landfill it, you have to burn it. So there is no real use. You're adding money on top of, uh, of for treatment while you can do it in a waste incineration plant in one step. So um, as I said before, MBTs in Germany, there's no hype anymore and there's no there's no new plants. Basically, they are being phased out. The issue for me is always, if you have any process, whatever it is called, you have to look at that you get a sellable or a usable product out of it, other, to bring the material back into the, into the circle. Because otherwise, it's, it's a sham recycling or a sham recovery. And this is basically what happened uh, in, with MBT in, in uh, Germany. Thank you. Thank you, Edmund. Uh, give the word to Rubens IB, please, Rubens. Well, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you very much to Roland again, to Edmund and to Mr. Uh, Christoph as well. My last question will be quite short and it's also regarding um, a very big misconception in Brazil that we have. Um, here we have our biggest opponents to waste energy and incineration. Uh, there's this big misconception that the more you incinerate or the most, like the most you recover from waste, uh, the less you recycle. But that seems to be a paradox. And then, as a matter of fact, it is. And my question is to Mr. Cordon, because as we see in Brazil, we just have a bit of composting, mostly landfilling and dump sites. And our recycling rates are about 3%. On the other hand, in the countries that you have waste energy technologies, you have around 40 or 45% uh, recycling, and the, the, these rates are much higher, as we have seen in those graphs. Um, as you also might be aware, we have a very, very big uh, number of waste speakers here in Brazil uh, who are the biggest responsible for recycling. What is actually recyclable? Um, my question to Mr. Cordom is like, how can we demystify this reality and show that if we bring waste to energy technologies, we're first not getting out their jobs. We're not uh, undermining recycling rates. Actually, it happens the opposite. There is this big misconception. I'd like you to, like, just if you have a message for, for those sector and for those people who recycle, how can you say how complementary is this technology and show that we're not against them or, or anything like this? That is my question. I try to be as quick as possible. Thank you. Thank you for, for this question. This is very important because uh, it's not only happening in Brazil. Uh, we, we have faced also this problem and this difficulty also in Europe and, for example, in France. Uh, they were rag pickers in, in France. They were, try, they were um, participating to the collection of waste. It was, everything was completely uh, mixed. Uh, they were uh, very annoyed initially when it has been, uh, uh, when the first uh, trash cans have been implemented, uh, for example, in France by an engineer and prefect, which was named Poubelle, Eugène Poubelle, who has given his name to the trash can in, here in France, uh, Poubelle, they were very unhappy because it was closed. And for them, it was much more difficult uh, to do the recovery of materials in this uh, Poubelle. Uh, and then when the first incineration plants have been built uh, uh, in France at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, uh, it was also a sort of competition. 
and, and you know, rack fight is a, a fight which is very tough. Nevertheless, uh, in fact, the conditions where they are working is, are terrible because they are, uh, they are uh, really uh, in the pollution. The, the, the impact for the uh, human health of these working conditions are terrible. There have been a report from the ISVA, so International Solid Waste Association, showing that the dump sites uh, uh, and with the rack pickers who are living on them, uh, almost 60 million, so almost the French population uh, equivalent, uh, they have disease and uh, their health, which is uh, really uh, uh, alterated by the conditions of living and the condition of uh, working directly on these dump sites. Uh, it has been shown also that the disease uh, uh, coming from these uh, conditions uh, are, are more uh, severe than malaria. We are giving money to malaria to decrease, but unfortunately we are not giving the public administration is not giving uh, enough money to reduce uh, uh, this terrible uh, thing, which is the dam sites. So there is a program from ISVA to close this dam site, which are in general the worst polluted places in, in the world, and also which are uh, leading this population to very bad uh, health uh, conditions. And when we are building uh, uh, waste management, correct waste management in these countries, and this has been the choice in China, this has been the choice in, in, in Europe or in Azerbaijan or, or, or in the Middle East, then uh, we can uh, allow these people also to have jobs because we can create infrastructure, infrastructure uh, with correct conditions of uh, working for the sorting of the material, uh, for example, coming from a selective collection, for the collection by itself also, uh, and we need more people to do uh, these uh, collections, of course. Uh, and the conditions of working and the conditions of living of these people are much better. For example, in our sorting facilities that we have implemented in France and that we are operating, we have some uh, specific uh, companies for to insert people who are a bit away from the society. So this is what we call insertion of people in difficulty. So for example, people who have a lot of difficulties to find jobs and things like that. So we offer them this type of jobs for one, two, three years to give them uh, uh, the possibility to find out afterwards uh, better qualification uh, jobs. So there are possibilities to, to, uh, to give them uh, jobs, but especially there are possibilities to give them much better conditions of living and working. That's the way, Cordo. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone have to compliment? Uh, we have now three questions from the public. Uh, the first one is Carolina Medina uh, to Edmund. What is the percentage of the cost of the exhaustion gas cleaning system? What is the, I'm sorry, what? What's the cost of the exhaust gas cleaning system? Ah, okay. Well, that's obviously very different from uh, the country to country where you are, where you're at. Typically, we say if you take total investment of a waste energy plant, the flue gas treatment is maybe 15%, 20%. It depends a little bit upon the, the system. There is no, no direct number because investment costs obviously vary a lot from country to country. But flue gas treatment can be in this range of cost. It's not a small portion of the investment. Okay, thank you, Edmund. Uh, the second to Carlos Souza, to Mr. Graham. Uh, how do you see the integration of different sources of raw material to generate biogas and consequently energy? These sources are organic from the municipal solid waste and those from the rural environment. Well, well in, our, in our solution, it is typically uh, uh, not uh, waste from rural environment, from agriculture or from, from manure on these kind of things. It's typically, it's a food waste, waste from the food industry, uh, waste from restaurants. That is what is typically used in our, our technology in this 
horizontal type uh, digesters. So we, I mean, you can have other solution for more liquid organic fraction from the uh, rural industry, from the agricultural industry, uh, but this is not this, uh, the, the input material that we are using in, in our process. Thank you. But this is typically, much. as I said, in the ideal case, it's really coming from, 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 from supermarkets, food markets, from, from restaurants, separated at the source to, to get a, a clean product, to get a, a compost and a liquid fertilizer that you can really use in the agricultural industry. Thank you, Roland. I have a question to you. If you, not, if you do not separate in the source, uh, it's possible to separate in a machine separation and to use to produce uh, secure uh, organic, how can I say that, uh, secure it? Uh, yeah, of course, I mean, there's a, there's a, I mean, uh, some, some organic fraction, of course, in some plants is, is separated by mechanical treatment. So it's mixed, mixed waste and the organic waste is separated and goes then to the digestion plants. And of yeah. course, you will have a pre-treatment, a sieving, to take out before and after the plan. So you're, you're trying to get uh, this uh, plastic material, all that would not, should not be in that, uh, the compost, you try to take it out, but you, of course you will not succeed to, to 100%. So you will still have some, some small uh, plastic material remaining parts in, in, this, in these fractions. So, uh, but you can do it, yeah, of course, but you do not get the same quality. So do, do not get the quality that uh, can um, uh, be used, uh, let's say, in, 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 in the agricultural industry. But you can maybe use it in, in parks, let's say, for, uh, 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 for, for such, for such uh, reasons, you can use it still, yeah. It is also a bit depending on, on, on local legal requirements and standards, of course. Okay, thank you, Roland. Uh, the, the, the last question for Cordon, uh, Charles Carneiro said that the organic fraction is separated by UK and French citizens. Sorry, can you, can you repeat the organic fraction? Uh, the, the organic fraction is separated by UK and French citizens. Ah, um, in UK, not too much, uh, but it's coming. In, in fact, there is a European regulation which is asking, like uh, uh, Roland has said in Switzerland, is asking to have separate collection of organic, of organic fraction, which is meaning, in fact, a kitchen waste and green waste from the citizens. Uh, nevertheless, uh, food, uh, kitchen waste or, or green waste is not all the organic part of, of the waste, because you have a, a lot of all the things which are biogenic in the waste, such as textile, papers, and things like that. Uh, um, and when they are dirty, uh, they are in, in mixed waste. So you cannot, uh, you cannot recover all, uh, even if you have a bio waste separate collection, you, are, you don't have uh, a residual municipal waste going down to zero, uh, as it has been said by Flavio at the beginning. Uh, if you have separate collection of packaging, separate collection of bio waste, uh, uh, of glass and so on, uh, it, it's remaining residual municipal waste at the end and which are uh, polluted. Uh, and it has been said by Roland, you need to avoid this pollution going in the soil, for example, when you are doing uh, compost. Uh, so the European regulation is asking now to, to promote, uh, especially with large producers like restaurants or supermarkets, uh, and to avoid to waste this, uh, this food uh, food waste and kitchen waste, and to try to have uh, uh, organic recovery for that. Uh, but it's going step by step. And for example, in Paris, which is extremely dense population, uh, for people, it's very difficult to have three or four uh, poubelle uh, trash cans uh, in the very small kitchens. Uh, so it's really difficult to have this separate collection in uh, very dense uh, uh, cities. Mm -hmm. I have to give thank you to everyone right in the event. I will give you one minute to everyone to, to say goodbye, to say the final considerations. And please, uh, first, Edmund, 
One minute. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope it uh, enlightened a little bit the situation now it's in Germany. If you have any questions, I'm sure the organizers can forward my email address and you can approach me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pardon, please. Uh, thank you very much for the organization of this uh, webinar, which uh, I think was extremely rich in, in, in information. Uh, the same as Edmund, my uh, email address is on uh, the, the slide uh, that you could uh, that you could see. Uh, and to conclude, I would say really waste to energy is a part of a circular economy. And it's a part which avoids uh, circular pollution. So we need quality recycling, but we need the final thing for the pollution and which is allows us to have renewable energy. So build energy from waste. Thank you. Thank you. Pardon, please. Well, Ray. Yeah, thank you, uh, Yuri, our brain for organizing this event. It was very, very nice to be part of it. Um, uh, as the other said, I mean, you can contact me. I'm also typically once a year, at least in, in Brazil, participating in the West Expo Brazil, which will most likely not happen this year. So next year. And you can also write emails in Portuguese, so I can easily understand. Most likely will respond in English, but uh, you can write the emails in, uh, in Portuguese, that's fine. And one recommendation for everybody, I mean, that you can Google, look at uh, Google for Ilia das Flores. It's a very impressive uh, movie um, showing the situation many, many years ago in landfills in Brazil. I think this landfill was in Porto Alegre. Uh, very impressive how well people did live from the waste put on that late fill after animals have taken the good parts. So there is also, I mean, someone from Brazil showed me that and, and explained me that there is a development in Brazil, so we can think positive. So, I mean, also in the future, I mean, uh, in the landfills, in the sanitary landfills, there are no, no people living anymore on the landfill, living from that. Also, catadoras cannot pick waste from there, and there will be will be place for the waste pickers, catadoras also in the future. Uh, uh, continuously develop all streams, uh, recycling, separation, uh, and, and and thermal and biological waste treatment solutions. So all this has to go hand in hand, and and takes a long time. So it's nothing that you change from today to tomorrow. It takes you. Uh, well, it would come more than decades. You cannot do it as fast as they did it in China. So it will take you decades to, 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 to develop all those solutions. So I think you should really start today. And uh, there is room for, for everybody in, in, this, um, in this environment, actually. Thank you, Roland, very much. Flavio, please. I would like to thank you again, Rudy, uh, for organizing this. Uh, it's, uh, and everybody, Cordon, Edmond, and Roland, I think it's been it's been extremely rich uh, presentations, and uh, I do hope it will you help people uh, understand better uh, uh, how important this is uh, uh, waste water technology, and it does not compete uh, with uh, uh, with the others. As long as we have a separate collection gang, uh, you put uh, the, the right technologies on the right place. Everybody has. Uh, as Roland has said, everybody has a place uh, uh, in the uh, its place in the waste management system. Uh, all the technology. So, I hope this will help people uh, and other webinars that will, will come to, to to help people understand uh, uh, how sustainable it is. And uh, hope uh, hopefully soon uh, we're going to have uh, a plant in Brazil as well. Thank you, everybody, for 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 the collaboration. Thank you, Flavio. Please, Antonio. Thank you, Mr. Fleck, Mr. Cosmon, and uh, Mr. Grail. Uh, Abrain has a challenge, a very, very important challenge, and a mission uh, to help to change this market, this waste market. And uh, I, I think Brazilians uh, need a, a new way to manage the, their uh, waste. And uh, nowadays we are more or less like uh, Mr. Cordhome cartoon. Uh, we are still with, uh, we are still with uh, our uh, square wheels, and uh, we need to change to uh, uh, another kind of wheels. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for everybody. Thank you, please, Rubens. 
Well, guys, thank you very much once again, Mr. Fleck, Mr. Kyle, uh, Mr. Cordom. I think, uh, well, I make uh, Bolognese's words mine as well. I think we have a huge challenge as it happened in other parts of the world. But I'd like to thank you, the three companies and the three directors, because for us, it's also very important to inform the Brazilian market, our public authorities, institutions, government industries. So I think this webinar, to have it in this high quality from the three presentations from you guys, it means a lot to us. I think it's a great step to change uh, our, our future in Brazil. And I'm very thankful for that once again, guys. Thank you very much. And uh, well, wish you a nice day. Thank you. I have to be thank you to Edmund Fleck, Crystal Cordon, Roland Gray, Flavio Matos, Antonio Bolesi, Rubens, Hamlet IB. Uh, we are ending our second Abra International webinar, Waste to Energy Technology. Uh, if someone uh, wants to, to know more about Waste to Energy, call to us, send an email, send a message in our uh, social medias. We are here to respond to all the questions. Uh, we have the this event will be organized by a brand and supported by Global WTIT Council, BDA, Martin, Itachi, Kenin, BW Expo, NLG Hub, Ambiental Recantinho, Agenda Urbana Brazil. Thank you very much for you that are assisting this webinar. At the end, obrigado a todos. Estamos à disposição. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.